So I'm not going to talk as fast. Same material. I'll probably add a couple things at the end, maybe extend it out a little bit, if you guys are all right with that. So like people have mentioned this very clickbaity title, Will Microservices Die? First of all, I'm Rich Haggerty. I work for IBM. I'm a developer advocate looking at new technologies. I'm more Java runtime focused. This is about microservices, but at the end, I'll, I'll deviate a little bit into Java. So the agenda we're going to talk about, let's see, I can read better up here. Uh, myths and facts about microservices, things you should know, the future, and a little bit about Java performance. So first thing we need to define microservices, um, and we can start by saying what it's not, which is a monolith, right? That's where most people are. That's, that's the standard, and it's old news, monoliths. They're old-fashioned, they're problematic, they're evil, but they work, and half the country, so it's like Java 8, right? No one admits they're using Java 8, but half the country is using it. Um, monoliths are around, we have clients that have, are running the same application, never taking it down for years. That's how solid they are. But it's not new and shiny. We all want to go to the cloud. We want to take advantage of cloud technology. So we're, we're talking about microservices. So these are the microservices over here. They're all maintainable and testable as single units, uh, independently deployable, loosely coupled. That's the key. Microservices should not count on other microservices being up for their livelihood. Um, organized around business capabilities. You want the like-minded people working on things that they understand and owned by a small team. Some myths about microservices. The smaller, the better, the more, the merrier. Not true. It depends on the function, right? They could be very small, they could be very, they could be huge. I've seen some very large microservices. Um, Microservices are the destiny. Monolith will have to be migrated. All monoliths are going to have to eventually be migrated. So here's an interesting poll taken last year. So this is the amount of people actually doing microservices, only about 17%. 54 are content with their monoliths. And this is really interesting. 12% have started and they decided to go back. Some more myths, microservices make developers' job easier, increases productivity, boosts performance, microservices are fast. That's the selling points, but once you get into it, it's just like any other development, right? It all depends on communication and, and working good as, as a team. Um, this is a Java influencer, he, he brought up a good idea, he goes, why don't we take these microservices, combine them into one big application and call it something new and everyone will jump on that bandwagon because he's tired of uh, microservices. But when implemented correctly, like a couple of you folks have mentioned, you've done it, so. Microservice facts, uh, independent deployment, need continuous development pipeline. That's the key, right? The whole point of microservices, one big point, is maintainability. Right, so you have the accounting microservice over here. You want to make updates. You can do those independent of everything else. You don't have to roll the whole application to get those updates. Um, owned by a small team, we talked about that. Shouldn't have any code sharing, no database, no database sharing. So these are independent, loosely coupled. Very little integration between microservices other than through their APIs. And they are agnostic to language. You can implement them in any language. So things you should know if you're going to do microservices. Is it the default answer for your, all your problems? I think we all know the answer. No, it isn't. Microservices still need a good architecture. So some of the more common architectures used for this right now are domain-driven design, event-driven design, this is pretty funny. Don't go down the resume, resume driven design, right? I haven't done that. I need to add that to my resume. Um, day two operations, real important. Has anyone heard that term before? Day two operation is basically, here's our new application with microservices, all in containers. Second day comes, it's been running, now what? 
How do you determine if it's working right? Right? You have to have a standard programming model to interact with other microservices. So open API is a good, good way to go with that. Set those APIs up front, set up contracts, know that you affect others when you change those. Um, be mindful of refactoring monoliths to, to microservices. So the people I asked earlier have implemented microservices. Did you come from a monolith? You said sort of. Anyone else? Did you come from kind of? So there, if there are tools out there, you should take advantage of them. One of them is I work for IBM. Anyone heard of WebSphere? It's been around for 25 years. It's a Java runtime. We have a new version of that that runs containers. It's more um, cloud native. It's called Open Liberty. We have a tool called Mono to Micro that actually uses AI to look at your monolith and breaks it down and says, this is where you need to sp split it up. So I know other tools like that exist. Take advantage. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to get into these. So monoliths and microservices will coexist in going into the future. But what the, the important thing that you should take away from this is you have to change your mindset. Whether you stick with monolith moving to cloud or you're going to go to microservices, you need to embrace this cloud native application concept. Cloud native application. There's so many tools on the cloud to support your application. But if you don't provide your application in a way that it can understand that, you're really going to defeat, uh, you're defeating the purpose of it. What are cloud native applications? Here's a really good starting point. This was developed about 12 years ago. It's called the 12 point, uh, 12 factor um, application methodology. And this was developed by Heroku, who was one of the early cloud platform providers. They took a look at what was working, what wasn't, as teams tried to bring forth their, their development, their uh, applications. And they came up with guidelines, best practices. And these are the 12 factors. I'm not going to go into each one of them. But basically, some of the things are kind of obvious, right? Code base is all going to be driven from the same code base um, in GitHub or some uh, repository like that. Your dependencies are going to be really explicit down to version number so you can reproduce your builds. Configuration is always external to your source code. Um, have these well-defined build, release, run um, processes in your, in your pipeline. Concurrency, that's taken care of with your orchestrator like Kubernetes. Disposability, so your microservices need to be able to start clean and, and, and clean up when they're done. This is one of the key ones, the dev prod parity. What we're saying there is whatever you're using to develop should be as close to as possible what you're, produce, you're, you're gonna put out in production, right? So we don't have different folks working with different source code. We get the same code base. We say, I wanna build a test version. It's gonna be the same code. It's gonna be talking to the same databases, whether they're stubbed out or whatever. You're gonna test the same code. It's, it's in containers, you're gonna test in containers. So you want those as, as close to as, uh, the same as possible. Logging becomes ultra, ultra important in a uh, microservice world. Um, you can have thousands of instances of your microservice. You have an error. How do you see that? How does it tie to that instance running in another location on another, um, another site? Logging is huge. And of course, your admin processes should be a part of the code, but they should be called externally as one-offs. Um, over time, I said that was developed about 12 years ago. Since that time, we've, they've added some more. API first, we've kind of talked about that. Define your APIs up first, what your microservice is going to provide. Set up contracts, saying this is what uh, all your clients are going to say. I understand that contract. I will live with that. So if anything changes, your build will find that, not when you run. <clears throat> Telemetry is, is basically logging extended. So Kubernetes has hooks in it that it will ping your microservice and can determine its health and its metrics. But you have to supply that. Going through these. So 
Like I said, there's a lot of companies, a lot of standards, a lot of folks out there trying to make your life easier. Um, so there's a lot of API standards out there. These are the micro profile and Jakarta EE with Java, right? These are open specs that define how you should define your applications. A lot of these runtimes implement those specs. Like I, I work for IBM, that's Open Liberty. You got Quarkus from Red Hat, all the big players. Jakarta has got, oh, this slide's pretty interesting. So different versions of the spec, depending on what you want to build. I'm going through these kind of fast. And of course, everything has to be containerized. You know the tools, Podman or Docker. And when you have those, you can deploy them anywhere, any type of cloud, private, public, or hybrid. So the other thing, has anyone implemented serverless? So this comes up a lot. So is cloud-native cloud applications obsolete with serverless? So the concept is serverless, it's either on or off. So you have an application out there when it's servicing a request, it starts up, service the request, and goes away. You as a consumer only get charged for what the time that it's uh, servicing the request. So a lot of folks are jumping on that because it sounds pretty good um, as far as uh, using resources. Some myths about serverless, it actually does have a server, obviously, um, but it's always in an idle state when not being used. It's a pay as you go, um, occasionally running in fast operations, scaling to zero. So basically, serverless is for short-lived applications. That was the intent. People are kind of uh, abusing it, but that's what it was for. Now here are some of the implementers of serverless. IBM Code Engine, Amazon Lambda, you probably have heard that one. Google Function and Azure Function. There's also Kubernetes extension called Knative, if you're aware of that. That's, that's scaled to zero, basically the same thing. Um, now in the Java world, this is pretty interesting. So any Java developers or work in Java shops? No one? One, okay. So the biggest problem with Java is it has, the um, biggest problem is its strength. It was written 25 years ago. It runs monoliths, and it, like I said, it can run for years because it has great garbage collection. It has internal compilers, so the code is so optimized. As it's running, the longer it runs, the better it gets. Profilers go out and check the code, see what's actually the parameters that are being passed, optimize the code that way. That's called dynamic compiling. That happens as it runs. So that's a benefit. People like that. The problem is, let's make that into a microservice. Well, it takes now 10 seconds to start up because it has to do all that, right? So instantaneous startup is, is not a thing with Java. So whenever there's an opening, people jump in. So here are some options that have come up lately to try to solve this issue. Graal VM. And um, Graal VM basically does static compilations of Java code. So it treats your code like C. The problem with that is you lose the garbage collector, you lose the JVM, and there's some dynamic features of Java you lose. Not the best solution. A better solution is taking the Linux Cryu technology. Has anyone heard of that? Cryu has been around for a long time. It stands for Checkpoint Restore in User Space. Basically, you can take a process in Linux and you could say, I'm running, stop it, take a checkpoint, kill it. Come back the next day, start it, you'll start exactly the same spot. So that, that technology has been pushed up into the JVMs now. So there's actually OpenJ9, which is an open source JVM, um, has this feature called Instant On. So you basically start up a container, run your Java application, it'll take a snapshot as soon as the application loads, It'll, it'll shut down and it'll keep that image, and that's what you load in your Docker file. And now when you start that container again, it starts up instantaneously. I'm gonna sh I'll show a demo of that real quick. So I, the, the key point there is microservices are not the same as serverless, if you hear that. Microservices are supposed to be, they, they last a while. They're not, not up or down. So when you're talking about scaling of microservices, we're talking about scaling from one instance to n instances. 
Scale to zero or serverless is talking about scaling from zero or one. Zero or one. Um, before I leave, I want to give a plug. So at 4.55, I'm doing a talk a couple rooms down Then I'm going to talk about microservices in Java. If There's not a lot of Java folks here, so you may not be that interested. But basically, the, the concept there is we're going to pull the JIT that does the compiles out of the JVM and make it a remote service. And now all your JVM clients will talk to this JIT. And the, and the results are fascinating. So key takeaways, I do want to do a demo if you want to stick around for a minute on that instant on. So key takeaways, do not use microservices as a goal. Define your problems first. Monolith is not evil. Use best practices. Um, cloud native applications um, definitely go down that road. So if there's one little nugget you could take, if you want to go to cloud, you want to develop applications, embrace cloud native technologies. All right, let me do a little demo real quick. By the way, that took, well, I don't know. I started my clock timer late. All right. So I have this Java application. It basically, it's a simple app, comes up and it shows system metrics and um, some system properties for the underlying host. Now, if I run, let me do this, where is it? I have a, so this is the normal application. This is how long it takes to start up a uh, job application. Simple application, still running, here we go. Can you see that? Five seconds, All right? And here's the application. There you go. It returns system properties and some, uh, some metrics and health. So that's five seconds normally. This is the solution for serverless, by the way. So now I'm going to start it with, um, so I, I created an instant on or a cry you image with the same application. I started it and stopped it took a snapshot of that and put it into a container. So now let's see how long it takes. So there you go, it took 358 milliseconds. Pretty impressive. Now, I also set up a AWS cluster with Kubernetes and the extension Knative. So I have both of those images sitting in Knative and it's got a 30 second timeout. So if it doesn't get a request, it goes idle and sits there for a while. So let me do this. Let me kill that application. I think I have the pods command. I could type it, but there it is. So right now it finds there is nothing running in the pods. It's dead. That means it's been over 30 seconds since I accessed this. So here is the first, so I have this loaded already, the page, but if I go to refresh it, or I ask for system properties, it's gonna send another request. So I'm gonna click on this link. So this is a normal version. So if you wrote a Java application, you wanna take advantage of serverless, this is how long it takes. We'll go ahead and start. Click. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Took 10 seconds. So now here comes the instant on version. Testing the demo gods. Let's see how it works. One, two, three. So three, a little over three seconds. And what happens is Knative itself takes three seconds to fire up. It's gonna get better. Um, but that just tells you the difference. So this is acceptable, three seconds, three point, you know, th 300 milliseconds um, is acceptable, the other one really isn't, so. That is um, a instant on solution to serverless for Java applications. I know you guys aren't into Java, which is kinda, 
What do you guys develop your Microsoft? What, what language? Uh, we use Go. Oh, OK. So Go is real popular with serverless, too. Has anyone implemented any serverless functions? Uh, no JS. OK. No JS. OK. And what does it do? Okay, so it's a it's a it's an administrative function you do once in a while just to yeah, to pull. Have another one that unsubscribes to a mailing list automatically. Okay. So, yeah. So that's a perfect example of what a serverless is intended to be, right? It's a function that isn't very it doesn't isn't used very often, but it's there. Your code is probably in the code base, right? It's probably an API that isn't probably called by the, any any other part of your application, but you can create this little function, start up, get the information, and die. That's what it's for. But f folks are, are, are looking at that model going, hey, that, that sounds cheap. It only gets it only get charged when it's being accessed. What if I put my whole monolith on serverless? Right? No one's using it at night? I don't know. Um, so one of the big, the big problems with um, microservices, what you're going to find, is, is people are, the intentions are correct. Right? We want to take this monolith. We want to put it into microservice so we can take advantage of all this cloud technology. They're moving it to cloud, thinking they're going to save money. And they don't initially. It takes, it takes work. Your containers are going to be too big. Um, your scaling is not going to work right because there's not going to be efficient scaling. So you have to have more instances running than you want. You're going to wind up, and then you get that Amazon bill, and you're going to say, hey, are we really saving that much? Um, so it's that second day part where you figure out what's actually needed, uh, streamlining all that application code, making your containers smaller, all those things. But anyway, thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. Any, thanks. Any questions? Yes. Uh, any best practices for what to optimize day two? I mean, how to assess the application you pulled out? Let's say you, you get this humongous Amazon bill. Um, wh where to start? I mean, how to, how yeah, those are all features that you have to build into your application so they can determine metrics. Uh, MicroProfile has a good APIs for that. So uh, metrics on health and um, logging, all that stuff to see what you're really doing. Where is it spending all of its time? That's, a hard, that's hard. There's no to hit button, make efficient. Right? It doesn't work like that. You have to dig deeper. Anything else? Well, hopefully in uh, 10 years, we're all talking about converting our microservices back to these monoliths. But anyway, thank you very much.